bit. I, I was thinking about uh, just like we've, we've been, everyone's been dealing with uh, dealing with the news reports and dealing with pandemics and dealing with all these kind of things that are going on in the world. And it's, um, it's caused a lot of people to question, um, question a lot of things, question um, uh, who's in control. Um, we, we kind of cling to um, government to look for solutions because we, we, want, we want to find a solution, we want control. Um, we want to know who's that someone's handling this, that someone's going to resolve these things, uh, whether it's pandemics or whether it's um, hatred and violence and all sorts of things that are going on in the world today. We can there's an endless list of things. Um, and the end of the day, um, what we're seeing is a, a redefinition of uh, what uh, everything is. We're trying, we're seeing a redefinition of. Um, gender roles and gen and marriage and um, you know the relationship between men and women where you know you can be a, a thousand um, you know uh, different uh, genders now and and you know there's everything's being uh, redefined um, and and in conflict with what God has designed and every and it's because man wants to be their own God ultimately that's been what we've seen throughout history and from the beginning in the, in the garden when uh, the serpent planted that seed of in, in Eve's ear and said, did God really say that? Um, that is something that's been going on ever since. It's, did God really say that in his word? Is that really what he's trying to say to us? Um, is he really in control or are you in control? Man wants to be sovereign. Man wants to be their own king. Um, and so we're seeing this redefinition taking place, and we're seeing a, a redefinition of Christianity as well. We're seeing a redefinition of the gospel. Um, and if we asked a, a lot of professing Christians, um, what is the gospel, many would not have a response. Um, they, they may say things like, um, God loves us, and he has a plan for our lives. He, he wants to have, give us our best life now. Um, and, and then others would say that Jesus died for, for sinners. And, and so they wouldn't know exactly how to say completely what is the gospel, may not even know it. We also see a redefinition of what sin is. Um, a lot of people like to say that we have syndromes rather than sins, um, that we're just wounded people um, and we just need a doctor to fix our, 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 our mistakes that we made. We, we don't realize how profound our sinfulness is. And so I, I kind of wanted to just look at Ephesians chapter 2 and kind of just break it down real quick and I personally I need the gospel every single day um, because I know that 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 there's there's things in my life that I need to I need to be killing sin so to speak more to getting rid of this and things that 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 temptations might lead my lead me astray I, I need the gospel I need I need a reminder every day so I'm focused on Christ um, that I have a great need for Christ and I have a great Christ for my need. And so I need to be reminded of that every single day. And so, um, when we look at Ephesians chapter two, um, it, it starts out with the bad news. Um, the gospel is good news, but oftentimes we don't, we don't tell the bad news and people don't think that they're not that bad. And so if they don't think that they just have wounds and they're just made bad decisions, um, the gospel is not that important and powerful, but in Romans chapter one, uh, verses uh, you know, one sixteen and, and seventeen, there it says, you know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel; it's the power to, uh, to save. Um, so if you look at in verse verse one of chapter two, it says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And so when you think about that that expression there, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. I mean that is some hard language that God is speaking to us about our condition without Christ. I mean, you think about what you were, you were, you were dead in your sins. You were, uh, you were, you were unable to do anything. A dead man can't save himself. A dead man can't raise himself up. He's, he's, he's dead. He can't, he's, he's helpless. And that is what we, we exactly were. Romans 3 talks about how no man seeks God. No one does good, not even one. 
So it's be, we can't seek God because we're dead in our sins. And if we're seeking God, we're oftentimes we're seeking the benefits of God, but not actually God. We many people want to they you know they they want God, they want heaven, but they don't want God to be there because they they want to have their good time and they don't want they don't want to give him glory. They want to receive all the glory and all the benefits and all the treasures, but without him. That is our our way of thinking. And when you think about what what does that mean? What does being dead in trespasses means? In verse 2, it it clarifies that. And it says, uh, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. So you followed your own desires. You followed what society tells you. You followed what the culture says. You followed what everyone else is doing. You you went with the flow. And we see how easy that is now, how people fall into that. They'll say, well, this is what is offensive and so don't do, so you, if you're against this, then you are offensive and you're not tolerant. And you're, and so we are prone without Christ to go that direction, to follow the course of this world. And they're actually under the authority of, of the God of this world, the prince of power, of the air. The Bible also says that Satan is the God of this world, the lowercase g. And so, uh, and it goes on to say, in the spirit of that is now working in the sons of disobedience. So, we were sons of disobedience, and we were disobedient against God and His laws and His His ways. We we it goes on in verse three that among them, we too formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, and we indulged in our our desires of the flesh and of our mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. And you think about what that that word say, because everyone likes to say we're all children of God, but the Bible says something differently and augustine once said if you believe what you like in the gospel and reject what you don't like it's not the gospel you believe but yourself and so when you think about what that says that by nature children of wrath that you were an enemy of god you were you were dead in your sins you were a slave to your sin you were an enemy of god you're an enmity with him and psalm 7 11 talks about how he's angry with the wicked every day and um, you think about in John 8:44 when he said to uh, responded to those that were coming against him, and Jesus said, "Your father is the devil, uh, and your will is to do the desires of the of the of your father." And that that is what a children of wrath do. They follow the the ways of this world. They follow their sinfulness. I mean, you think of it this way: that the God of all the universe, who who hangs the stars in the sky and tells the the sea to pause at the shoreline and return from where you came from. That and he he control and they all obey him, and yet he'll tell man to, to follow these, live holy, follow these 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 steps, be more like Christ. And man says, no, I don't want to do that. And that is what we're seeing in our world. This is why we're we're seeing so much conflict in this world because we're all in rebellion, and against. A holy God and against our Creator, and in Romans one it talks about how they have uh, they have turned their worship from the the Creator to the created things, and they've uh, and they were have been given up to their own lust of, and desires, and this is what we're seeing around us, and uh, you you know th- you you think about what that means of being dead in your sins and trespasses. Um, you know, when we we often think about that as as sinners without Christ, that we were just at some point swimming in the ocean and made bad decisions, and we were just we started to struggle and we started to drown, and someone threw a life raft out to us, and that was Jesus Christ, and we with our own strength and power we were able to grab a hold of that that life raft, and with our own strength and power we're able to pull ourselves into the, into the shoreline and be saved. And um, and the reality is our nature is sinful. Uh, a, a fish, his nature is to swim and it's to, to be in the ocean or to be in the water. It can't go against its nature. It can't go outside of the water and become an eagle and fly like an eagle. And that's how we are. Without Christ, our nature is bound to our sinfulness. And so we can't go against our nature. We follow our desires, our flesh, without Christ. We were dead in our sins on the bottom of the ocean, blue and bloated and unable to save ourselves. And and yet Christ did a work for us. And, it, and, and this is where this bad news 
is is so much sweeter. The gospel is so much sweeter when we think about the good news, because when we think about how Jesus broke down what the reality of sin and on the Sermon on the Mount, and he said, "Okay, you think you all obey the law perfectly? You think you never murdered anyone? You think you've done all? You've followed all these rules?" And he said, "Okay, well, I'll take it to another level. If you look at a woman with lust, you've actually committed adultery. If you take my name in vain, it, it, just simply of saying, oh my God, and you're not saying it in a term of, of worship and adoration to a, a holy God, that you're blasphemy. That's blasphemy. Uh, and you start to, you start to, he starts to attack all these things. You get angry with someone, you've actually murdered them in your heart. So now he's, he's, he's like heaping up the, the, the wrath of God against them, showing them in the mirror of his words that the, 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 the depravity that we have um, in, in, in our actions and our words and our thoughts and our deeds. And then you go in to see in verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 2, and it says, but God. And that is the beauty of that transition right there. But God, no one else, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love and with which he loved us. And it goes on, you know, when you think about the Sermon Mount, he says to love your enemies. And we were enemies of God. We were dead in our sins, slaves to our sins. We were in rebellion against sin, against God. And yet he loved his enemies so much that he knew us and he came and he, Christ, who is fully God and fully man, came off of his throne and he, he dwelt among us. And for 33 years, he experienced every temptation we would ever face and never sinned. He watched the rebellion of humanity, his own creation, uh, standing before him as they sinned and blasphemed before him who is God, and yet he was patient and, and long-suffering. And Romans 5, 8 through 10 says, But God shows his love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. And we see that Christ came as our substitute, lived my life that I could never live perfectly. He lived perfectly sinless so that I could live imperfectly sinless. And he went to the cross and he bore my sins and he, he bore my, the punishment I deserved. You think about in verse 5 and it says, Even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him. You think about who Christ, who laid the foundation of the earth, who determined its measurements, who hung the stars, who commanded the morning, who controls the temperature, who controls viruses, who the, who the waves stop at the seashore and return from where they came, who determines the date of our birth and, and our death. Jesus, the in, image of the invisible God, by him and for him all things were created, came to die on the piece of wood from the tree that he created. And he went to the cross, and it wasn't just the nails that, that were in his hands and feet that caused him excruciating pain. It was that the separation from his father, that he bore the, the wrath of God in all of his fury in, in his, in, upon himself on our behalf. When he was in the garden, he said, take this cup from me. What's in the cup? If you look in the Old Testament, it talks about the cup of wrath. He was saying, take this cup of wrath from me. And here he is drinking it to the very last drop on my behalf that I was so undeserving of. But God, being rich in mercy, by grace you have been saved. And he didn't just do that, but he raised us up to life. He raised us from a dead man on the bottom of the ocean, sinful and, in, and incapable of choosing God or seeking God. For that reason, Jesus said, you did not choose me, I chose you. And he seated us in heavenly places. When you think about in Romans 8, it talks about he who he foreknew, he predestined, he and he who he predestined, he justified, and he who justified, he glorified. And, and it's all in the past tense. In God's eyes, he did this before you were ever born. He saw you, he knew you, and he planned this. When you he was on the cross, you were on his mind. And he seated you 
at the at the in the heavenly places for Christ is reigning on the throne right now. There's nothing outside of his control. He's won, he's victorious, and he's patiently waiting for the day when he will return and will restore heaven and earth and, and as one. In Luke uh, 12, 49, when he came, he told us exactly what he was he came to do, to save sinners, but he said, I came to cast fire on the earth and will and and oh how I would want to do it and that it was already kindled. He was ready to, uh, seeing all the sinfulness, and he was ready to destroy it right now, and yet he was patient with us, waiting for us to, to come to the, to the throne room of grace. This is the beauty of the gospel. It's the only solution for this world. It's the only solution to the heart pollution that we have, our sinfulness. And yet, but God, being rich in mercy, he did this on our behalf. And we see in verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves. It's a gift from God. So you're, the grace of God, the faith that you have that gave you to believe is a gift from God. It's, it's this work that he's doing, doing in, your, in your life. You think about Ezekiel when it said, he, Ezekiel saw the valley of dry bones. And he said, can they live? And he said, Pro- prophesy or preach the gospel to them. And they began to form tendons and muscles and they began to form into an army and they, they lived, and, in, and within that same context, it says, I will take away the heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you. This is the prophetic word of what he was seeing of the building of the church of Christ. Uh, and as, as he began to regenerate the heart and give you the gift of faith that you begin to see your sins differently, you begin to see your, your, the world differently. You begin to have a different relationship with your sin. You don't love your sin anymore. You hate your sin, and you want to kill that sin in your life, and you want to repent and, and turn from your sins and, and cling to Christ. That is a gift of God. A.W. Pink once said, Each of the three persons of the Blessed Trinity are, is concerned with our salvation. With the Father is predestination, and the Son propitiation. The Spirit regeneration. The Father chose us. The Son died for us. The Spirit quickens us. The Father was concerned about us. The Son shed his blood for us. The Spirit performs his work within us. What one did was eternal. What the other did was external. What the Spirit does is internal. And then in verse 9 it says, not by the result of works so that no man can boast. It's a work from God. But you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that you would be walking them. So here we see that all this is a work of God so that no man can boast. You are dead. Now you're alive. Who gets the credit? God alone. But then he also saw beforehand, he prepared beforehand these works of your hands that you would go forth and do, that you would go forth and make disciples and proclaim the gospel, proclaim this message that I'm saying today to others who are flooding into hell every single minute and to, to, and, to, and to preach as a dying man to a dying man that, that Christ can save them. And this is what God has prepared us to do. This is the beauty of the gospel. It's the only solution to this world's pollution. It's the only thing that will ever bring final restoration and reconciliation with sinful humanity to God himself. And the reality is, is that we oftentimes minimalize this work of God in our lives. We often don't meditate on it. We often forget about it. Oftentimes we never even heard it. We think we know the gospel and we don't know the gospel. And we're not impacted by it. And, and I pray that this will just be a reminder of encouragement to know that Christ is our all in all. And he has done this work on our behalf, it's a free gift that we can receive, and it's and it, and when we see our when we struggle with our sins and our and our temptations, that it's always a reminder that we depend completely on Christ and His finished work on the cross. The mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend. The agonies of Calvary. You, the perfect Holy One, crushed your Son who drank the bitter cup reserved for me. By your perfect sacrifice, I've been brought near. Your enemy, you've made your friend. Pouring out the riches of your glorious grace, your mercy and your kindness, know no end. Your blood has washed away my sin, 
Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied, Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you. Lover of my soul, I want to live for you. And so I pray that each one of you will desire to live for him as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. You don't whet the appetite. You always give us such a thorough soaking, and we are blessed by it. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Well, good morning.